Washington Labor Secretary R. Alexander Acosta on Tuesday faced fresh calls to resign and rising pressure from inside the Trump administration over his role in brokering a lenient plea deal over sex crimes for the New York financier Jeffrey E. Epstein when he was a federal prosecutor in Miami more than a decade ago. Mr. Acosta, 50, told a friend this week that the plea agreement, in which Mr. Epstein served 13 months after being accused of sexually abusing dozens of young women and underage girls, was the toughest deal available in a complex and difficult case. The prosecution, he said, would have stood a far better chance of succeeding in the state courts, the same argument he has been making for years. The crimes committed by Epstein are horrific and I am pleased that New York prosecutors are moving forward with a case based on new evidence, Mr. Acosta wrote Tuesday on Twitter. With the evidence available more than a decade ago, federal prosecutors insisted that Epstein go to jail, register as a sex offender and put the world on notice that he was a sexual predator, he continued. Now that new evidence and additional testimony is available, the New York prosecution offers an important opportunity to more fully bring him to justice. That is not likely to satisfy critics. Mr. Acosta has a lot of explaining to do and none of his public statements to date come anywhere close to providing a rational explanation, said Jack Scarilla, a Florida lawyer who represents several of the victims. The indictment on Monday of Mr. Epstein by the United States attorney in Manhattan, Jeffrey S. Behrman, on child sex trafficking charges and a raid on the hedge fund billionaire's mansion that uncovered a cache of lewd photographs represents a grave threat to Mr. Acosta, and an implicit rebuke of the deal he cut as United States Attorney for the Southern District of Florida. Congress's top Democrats, including Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, called for his resignation, as did the Miami Herald, which uncovered the details of the plea deal which was initially kept secret from victims under the agreement between Mr. Acosta and one of Mr. Epstein's lawyers, J. Lefkowitz. If Acosta, when he was U.S. attorney in Miami, had shown an ounce of sympathy for the vulnerable girls Epstein sexually exploited, they would have had a powerful voice on their side, the paper's editors wrote. If Acosta had not shown himself to be ethically challenged ten years ago, we wouldn't be calling for his resignation as U.S. Secretary of Labor now. For the moment, President Trump supports Mr. Acosta, although two senior administration officials said that could quickly change if more damaging details emerged about the plea agreement. Mr. Trump said on Tuesday that he felt badly for Mr. Acosta and praised him as an excellent Secretary of Labor as he met with the Emir of Qatar. He added, I do hear there were a lot of people involved in that decision, not just him, a reference to the Epstein plea deal. But he said the White House would look into the matter very carefully. Former law enforcement officials who referred the case to state and federal prosecutors in South Florida in 2006 praised the New York prosecutors for completing a job they said Mr. Acosta could not, or would not, do more than a decade ago. Thankfully, U.S. Attorney Behrman and the other authorities in New York have the good judgment to investigate and prosecute Epstein in the way that should have occurred in Florida over a decade ago, said Michael Ryder, the former chief who ran the Palm Beach Police Department at the time of the Epstein investigation. Ultimately, the appropriate authorities should apologize to the victims for the way that this was handled by prosecutors in Florida change the laws that allow children to be labeled prostitutes and do whatever is necessary to make sure that this miscarriage of justice cannot happen again, he said. The evidence against Mr. Epstein a decade ago in Florida was overwhelming, said Mr. Scarilla, calling the terms of the non-prosecution agreement signed in secret by Mr. Acosta's team totally unjustifiable. Even more egregious was the fact that Epstein was not only given personal immunity, his named and unnamed co-conspirators were also immunized for all of their unspecified crimes, he said. That kind of get-out-of-jail-free card is unprecedented and a patent abuse of prosecutorial discretion. Several Democrats in the 2020 presidential field attacked Mr. Trump, who socialized with Mr. Epstein and once described him as a terrific guy, for standing by Mr. Acosta. The charges against Jeffrey Epstein are sickening,
and I am enraged that President Trump, who himself has been credibly accused of sexual assault, is harboring someone in his cabinet who sold out these survivors, said Senator Kirsten Gillibrand of New York. Secretary Acosta should be fired immediately but this president shamefully never stands up for women. The White House press secretary, Stephanie Grisham, did not reply to a request for comment. I'm giving you a no comment, said Eric Holland, Mr. Acosta's spokesman. White House officials, speaking on condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to speak publicly on personnel matters, said Mr. Trump had no plans to fire Mr. Acosta, whom he regarded as a loyal and, until now, no drama member of his cabinet. Mr. Trump has often stood by embattled cabinet members and other subordinates at first, only to turn on them later when their plight has become a personal embarrassment or political liability. Mr. Acosta has not spoken with the president about the Epstein case recently, according to a senior White House official familiar with the situation. Trump aides said the decision ultimately rested with Mr. Acosta, and whether he was willing to ride out the ugliest episode of his career. A key moment to watch, aides said, will be next week's scheduled cabinet meeting. If Mr. Acosta quits, it will likely happen before then, aides said. Mr. Acosta has rankled some in the West Wing over his reluctance to move rapidly on Mr. Trump's deregulatory agenda, which could cause him trouble now, aides said. Joe Grogan, Mr. Trump's domestic policy adviser, has long been skeptical of Mr. Acosta for failing to expedite Mr. Trump's apprenticeship agenda, which is backed by the president's daughter Ivanka and her husband, Jared Kushner. Earlier this year, Mr. Grogan forced out Mr. Acosta's chief of staff, in a move aimed at prodding Mr. Acosta to comply with White House demands. Their relationship has improved recently, aides said. But the Epstein controversy has damaged Mr. Acosta's reputation in the White House and all but killed Mr. Acosta's ultimate goal of getting a judicial appointment in the United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, which encompasses Florida, aides said. None of Mr. Acosta's fellow prosecutors in the Miami United States Attorney's Office have come forward to publicly defend his conduct in the Epstein case. But two former Acosta colleagues and another former Justice Department lawyer familiar with the case cast his role in a more favorable light. The case, they said, was flawed from the moment that FBI officials, frustrated that local prosecutors could not get Mr. Epstein labeled a sex offender, presented it to Mr. Acosta's office in hopes of getting a tougher penalty. The case was a headache from the start. In 2006, Mr. Epstein's high-powered legal team met with senior prosecutors in Mr. Acosta's office to persuade them to drop the case. Alan Dershowitz, one of Mr. Epstein's lawyers, argued that the federal sex trafficking law cited in the 53-page indictment prepared by the FBI made the case difficult because Mr. Acosta's team would have to prove that Mr. Epstein crossed state lines with the intent to abuse minors. Mr. Acosta and his team were already aware of the complications, at the time, only a handful of Mr. Epstein's young accusers were known, and local prosecutors in Palm Beach had been frustrated by the lack of cooperation among some alleged victims whom they suspected were either being paid off or intimidated by Mr. Epstein. Others gave contradictory statements that Mr. Epstein's legal team would likely pick apart in court, according to attorneys involved in the case. Mr. Acosta also had to persuade his superiors in Washington to ignore a request by Ken Starr, the former Whitewater special counsel working for Mr. Epstein who went over Mr. Acosta's head to try to kill the case with Republican appointees at Department of Justice headquarters. In a three-page defense of his actions, written in 2017, Mr. Acosta argued that Mr. Epstein's team engaged in a year-long assault on the prosecution and prosecutors that included hiring private investigators to look into the personal lives of his team. I use the word assault intentionally, as the defense in this case was more aggressive than any which I, or the prosecutors in my office, had previously encountered, he wrote in the letter, first reported by the Daily Beast in 2017.
Mr. Acosta's team became convinced that getting a settlement that fulfilled two nominal goals, labeling Mr. Epstein a registered sex offender and putting him in prison, was the most likely positive outcome for the case. A. Marie Villafana, a top Acosta deputy who still works in the West Palm Beach office, argued to bring the case to trial, in hopes of getting a stiffer sentence, according to former prosecutors who worked with her. But Mr. Acosta decided to settle and Ms. Villafana, the aggressive lead prosecutor, worked with Mr. Epstein's legal team, going so far as to suggest she would file a charge in district court to cut the press coverage of the deal, according to emails first obtained by the Miami Herald. She also at times pushed back and seemed exasperated by the many demands by Mr. Epstein's lawyers, the emails show. The bottom line, Mr. Acosta concluded in his letter, is that Mr. Jeffrey Epstein, a billionaire, is now a registered sex offender. But to Mr. Acosta's critics, it was not only the substance of the plea deal that was troubling but also Mr. Acosta's apparent coordination with Mr. Epstein's lawyers to keep details quiet. That was done so victims would not have time to scuttle the deal. Pursuant to the illegal agreement the victims were not only kept in the dark, they were actively lied to by government agents, Mr. Scarola said. Hiding the secret deal was inexcusable.